escucha. ¿Sí? Eh, bueno, pues quiero darle las gracias por su asistencia. Eh, estamos realmente eh, muy contentos de que el doctor David Gordon esté con nosotros. Realmente él es una eminencia en el tema de la pobreza y estamos, pues es un honor tenerlo aquí con nosotros, doctor. Y pues darle las gracias al doctor Cortés por su iniciativa de tener este, este evento, bueno, esta, esta plática que seguramente será eh, muy interesante. Yo solamente les quería dar la bienvenida al doctor Gordon en especial y a todos ustedes por estar aquí y espero que sea pues una gran plática, una gran discusión. Muchísimas gracias. Yo los dejo. El doctor eh, Cortés va a hacer una eh, eh, va a hacer una semblanza del doctor este, Gordon. Entonces, bueno, adelante. Gracias. Gracias, Patricia. Bien, eh, voy a presentar una muy breve semblanza de una larga y muy creativa trayectoria en la Academia de la Bretaña y también del eh, mundo. El doctor David Gordon es profesor de Justicia Social y Pobreza en la Universidad de Bristol, en el Reino Unido. Actualmente encabeza el Instituto de Pobreza en la misma universidad y el Centro Peter Town para el Estudio Internacional de la Pobreza. El profesor Gordon es la principal autoridad a nivel mundial en el estudio de la pobreza desde el enfoque de privación relativa de Peter Townsend. Ha dedicado más de 30 años, y como ustedes ven no se les nota, al análisis internacional de la pobreza multidimensional y trabajó por mucho tiempo con el profesor Peter Townsend en la medición de pobreza en el Reino Unido. Ha sido el líder del grupo de medición de pobreza y exclusión social de la Universidad de Lisboa. Entre sus contribuciones más destacadas están la medida global de pobreza multidimensional infantil para UNICEF en 2003 la medida oficial de pobreza multidimensional de la Unión Europea en 2012. También fue miembro del Grupo Río de Naciones Unidas para la medición de pobreza en 2006 y fue parte del Grupo de Expertos para el Diseño de la Medida Oficial de Pobreza Multidimensional Mexicana del Consejo Nacional de Evaluación de la Política de Desarrollo Social con EVAL. Sus aportaciones al estudio de la pobreza en el mundo han sido tales que en 2018 la Academia Británica de Ciencias lo hizo miembro que es un logro máximo en ciencias sociales en el Reino Unido, de algo así como un ser de la pobreza. Eh, eh, please, go ahead. Buenas, buenas días. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk in English because my Spanish is too terrible to inflict upon you. Uh, thank you very much for these wonderful introductions. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, this is the first time I have been uh, in uh, Flasco in Mexico, although I have uh, uh, been in Flasco in Argentina uh, a long time ago. Um, and it is a great honor to speak to such a knowledgeable audience. I'm going to talk about uh, trends in 
multidimensional poverty measurement. And as we're a reasonably sized audience, if at any point what I'm saying is unclear or you want to ask a question, please feel free to interrupt and, and ask him. I will not take offence, I promise. Okay, so I'm sure many of you are aware of the Sustainable Development Goals. In 2015, the governments of Mexico and the governments of all United Nations member states agreed unanimously to pursue these goals uh, until 2030. They are to guide social, economic, and environmental policy. The primary goal, the first goal, is to end poverty everywhere and leave no one behind. There are a number of specific targets. The first is to reduce extreme poverty to zero by 2030. The second target is to reduce by half multidimensional poverty using national definition. Now, as I showed you on the previous slide, there are 169 targets and 232 indicators. Every single one of those targets and every single one of those indicators has a UN organization whose responsibility it is to help countries to deliver on that, with the exception of the multidimensional poverty target. Now that's a problem because many countries, unlike Mexico, do not have measures of multidimensional poverty. So uh, there is quite a lot of work going on all around the world uh, by statistical offices and academics thinking how on earth are we going to deliver on the commitments the governments have made. So I'm going to talk about some of the trends that are occurring and also uh, some of the history and uh, how we got to the situation we're in. Okay, so to the United Nations credit, they have always had, or for a long time, had a multidimensional definition of poverty. The World Bank, the IMF, the UNDP, all UN organizations agreed in 1998 to this definition of poverty. It means a lack of basic capacity to participate effectively in society, not having enough to feed or clothe a family, not having a school or clinic to go to, not having land or a job to earn one's living, access to credit, etc., etc. Now, this comes as a surprise to many people because often the organizations like the World Bank tend to measure poverty just in simple below an economic threshold in terms of income or expenditure, rather than looking at these broader multidimensional issues. But as far as the UN has always been concerned in its official definition, it has always taken a multidimensional view, even if that's not how they've always operationalized. Now there have been a long history of multidimensional measures, particularly in Europe. These are details of different uh, welfare, multidimensional individual welfare measures, which have been pursued by European countries since at least the 1920s, in terms of welfare outcomes, welfare resources, or even in terms of human need, drawing on Max and F's basic human needs, idea, or having loving being model. I'm not going to talk about this because if I was to talk about all these multidimensional welfare measures, we would be here for several days. The other thing I'm not going to talk about is all the area-based multidimensional poverty and deprivation measures. So in Mexico, you have a marginality index. In my country, the United Kingdom, we have an index of multiple deprivation. In fact, I last count, there were like 27 different indexes of area-based multidimensional deprivation. Many countries have them, and again, I'm not going to talk about that because it would take several days. I'm going to talk about multidimensional poverty uh, at more at individual level rather than area level or household level. Okay, so let me give you a brief prehistory of multidimensional poverty. 
there have been uh, at least six, seven hundred years of uh, poverty research in the United Kingdom and in Europe. Uh, some of these early investigators were, were accused of witchcraft and burnt uh, you know, by the religious authorities. Uh, but uh, by the 18th century, instead of looking at the poor as an administrative category who received benefits from the parish or the state, there began to be the beginnings of social science investigations. So Frederick Morton Eden, at the end of the 18th century, wanted to understand the nature of poverty. What condition were the poor in England living? And in order to do this, he invented the survey questionnaire. That was the first ever survey questionnaire. He asked 21 questions of the 181 English and Welsh parishes, which were in charge of taxing the wealthy in order to pay for the poor. Now, the first social security system, or one of the first social security systems in the UK. Karl Marx, I think, slightly unfairly in Capital, argued that he was the only disciple of Adam Smith in the 18th century that produced any work of importance. But this was the beginning of social science research into the conditions of the poor, and not just looking in terms of their income. Previous research had really just looked in terms of income. A hundred years later, Charles Booth undertook a, an equally mammoth investigation into mapping the degrees of poverty and wealth for every house in the municipality of London. And he, color, he produced coloured maps. Uh, this is uh, the street on which I was born, obviously not a hundred years ago. Uh, and uh, he had four groups of poor people. The ones coloured black were people who were so poor he considered them to be vicious and criminal. Uh, but he also mapped uh, the honest or uh, working class poor. Now, if you read undergraduate textbooks in your degree, they may give the impression that Charles Booth invented the poverty line and that maybe Roundtree perfected it. And Booth certainly popularised popularized the idea of a line of poverty. So he famously said that the division indicated here by poor and very poor may be arbitrary, but the word by the word poor I mean to describe those who have a fairly regular though bare income, such as 18 shillings or 21 shillings a week. Uh, that's about a US dollar or more at the time. For a moderate family, and by the very poor, those who fall below this standard. Now, it is not known how Booth arrived at these figures. They, he kept copious notes, hundreds of notebooks. There is no indication where this number come, came from. And it's very important to understand that he did not use income as a measure of poverty in assigning who was poor and who was not in his server. He sent visitors into houses and talked to teachers and, and, and church wardens and kept detailed notebooks. And subsequent analyses using multivariate statistics has shown that whether you were defined as poor or not depended in large extent on how overcrowded your accommodation was, if there were four more people living in one room, and also the subjective assessment of the people who went to do the interviews, uh, whether they thought they were poor or their lifestyle. So he used multidimensional measures, really, deprivation measures rather than income measures. And indeed, he was criticized uh, during his study uh, that he used appearances rather than some kind of objective me measure to measure poverty. And later in his later work, he used overcrowding uh, as his line of poverty rather than any income measure. And Roundtree did the same. He, although he talked about income, they used this as a heuristic device. Their actual way of uh, identifying the poor was to use a more multidimensional approach. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the Latin American and European origin of multidimensional poverty measures. 
because they are independent and fairly distinct. So, both Latin America and Europe developed independent traditions of multidimensional poverty measurement during the 20th century. In Latin America, following the work of Altamir at the end of the 1970s, unmet basic needs indicators were developed to complement low income measures of elementary poverty levels. And a few years later, in Argentina, Picalia and then Mnuchin developed a combined low income and UVM multidimensional poverty measure. They did this using a union approach. This means you were defined as poor if you suffered from either a low income and or from UVM deprivation. If you suffered from either, you were defined as poor. By contrast, in Europe, following the work of Peter Townsend, who was my late lamented boss for 20 years, Multidimensional poverty measures were developed by both academics and governments, which combined low income and deprivation measures using what's called the intersection approach, i.e. you're defined as poor if you suffer from both a low income and deprivation. So it's a much more restricted definition. Fewer people are, have both in combination than either or. Of course, more recently, Julio Bolgrinic in Latin America and Sabina Alkeri in Europe have developed intermediate approaches, partial union or partial intersection approaches, where the poverty rate falls somewhere between an intersection and union approach by using uh, various weighting methods. Unfortunately, the arbitrary nature of these weights often results in multidimensional poverty measures which have low reliability. <coughs> Sorry. They suffer from significant amounts of error. Now, why are these two different traditions? There's not much comparative discussion about why Latin America went for the bigger number and Europe went for a smaller number when they're combining deprivation measures and income measures. One of my ex PhD students, I think she's here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, looked at this issue and discussed the political economy of these different traditions. And she argued that in Europe there existed comprehensive welfare states and universal services, uh, certainly after the Second World War. And this meant that the primary policy goal of poverty measurement was to better target those who needed help, and hence adopt the intersection approach, what uh, Professor Bjorn Hallowad calls uh, targeting the truly poor. In Latin America, where there, in many countries there's an absence of universal services, the policy goals were to expand the service coverage, but also income supplementation, and hence the union approach to poverty measure. Okay, so many countries in Latin America have adopted UVM indicators, housing overcrowding, education, these are often uh, measured in, in censuses and surveys, and there is a long tradition of producing them. One of the problems has been that oh, these measures were developed quite some time ago, and as societies evolve and progress across Latin America, so the amount of error when using these measures begins to increase because a lot of these problems are being solved and so fewer and fewer people are suffering from maybe having another toilet and therefore as fewer and fewer people suffer from it so the measure uh, begins to erode in its, uh, its uh, uh, about reliability and this happened in the UK so we used to measure in the past uh, whether people had no heating, whether they had no water not water in the house or no hot water, whether their toilets were outside, those measures are now useless for measuring poverty because those problems no longer exist. And a similar problem is occurring with the UBA, traditional UBM measures in many Latin American countries. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing, obviously. But it does mean you have to update your multidimensional measure. Okay, of course, when I talk about traditions, 
there are notable exceptions. So the official multidimensional poverty measure in Mexico uh, uses a human uh, constitutional rights perspective and an intersection approach. You are poor if your income is below the income poverty line and if you're deprived of one more of your constitutional, social, and economic rights. Similarly, of course, in Europe, there are also union measures of poverty. So uh, there's a European 2020 measure which combines a low income measure called at risk of poverty, a severe material deprivation measure, and the households where there's very low amounts of work being done by household members. So in this measure, you are considered poor if you suffer from one or more of these different problems. And the European Union has a uh, target to reduce by 20 million uh, the number of people who are poor using this measure by 2020. And in, when the measure started in 2010, 23% uh, to 115 million people uh, suffered from one of these problems. And in different countries, uh, there were different problems. So in Latvia, uh, the main problem was deprivation. In Italy, the largest problem was uh, low income. And in Ireland, the largest problem was jobless households. So it had some policy purpose. But it's not a very strong or coherent measure. So these were the targets. There were some countries like France, my own country, UK, Denmark, Sweden, which had no target at all. Other countries like Romania, uh, the target was what they actually had when they started. Yeah. So, and also the target was set in 2010 at the height of the austerity cuts following the financial crash. So several years ago, the European Union succeeded in meeting its targets. It's another triumph for the European Union. The definition of poverty in the European Union is multidimensional. And it draws on the work of Peter Townsend. They argue that the poor should be taken to mean persons, families, and groups of persons whose resources, material resources, cultural resources, and social resources so limited as to exclude them from the minimal acceptable way of life in the member state in which they live. This definition was adopted first of all in the 1970s and this was the last revision in the 1980s and it still legal, has legal force across all 28 countries in the European Union uh, in which we have 550 million people. It's a relative definition of poverty in terms of not in some absolute basket of goods, but as a minimum acceptable way of life in the member state and your own society. It's about having enough resources in order to buy the kinds of things that most people take for granted and participate as a citizen in your society. So in essence, it's a multi-dimensional definition. It draws on Townsend's scientific definition of poverty, where poverty is considered to be a command of uh, ins over insufficient resources over time. You don't have enough money in order to live in the way that your society is accustomed to. And the outcome of not having enough money and other resources is you become deprived. So in the 1960s, Townsend developed a series of deprivation indicators which he believed would be characteristic of people who uh, were living in poverty, the kind of things that were more taken for granted in a UK society at the time, uh, which uh, poor people may not be able to afford. And these included not just consumer durables, like having a refrigerator, but also, crucially for Townsend, not being able to participate in normal social activity. Townsend's theory argues that there are universal needs, such as the need to clothe yourself, have enough food uh, for shelter, but there are also universal social needs, 
such as the need to give presents at certain times of year, uh, to mark births, deaths, honouring your children's wedding, uh, to cook food and, and share it. And these occur in all societies at all places in time. The way they are met is different, but the universal needs remain the same. And so these indicators try and get at some of those universal needs as appropriate to British society at that time. What Townsend did was he plotted the deprivation index by just summing uh, the, the numbers that were there on, on this axis and income on the, the, the X axis. And what he found was that as income declined, so deprivation went up slowly. But there came a point where a small fall in income led to a steep rise in deprivation, and he considered that to be the objective of scientific poverty. So he used both deprivation and income in order to identify who were poor. Now, many governments and many academic studies then followed on from Townsend, and governments adopted official multi dimensional poverty measures. So the Irish adopted an intersection measure uh, called the Consistent Poverty Measure in 1997 as part of their national anti-poverty strategy and they revised and updated it in 2006. And the poor were uh, people who were below the European low income line, that's below 60% of the national median income after adjusting for the household type, and who lacked two or more of these items, uh, deprivation items. So this is a typical national uh, multi-dimensional poverty measure. In 1997, most of those items were to do with consumer durables and possessions, but that became less and less reliable, and now they include some social activities as well. Yes, yeah, it's important to realise that people will often go hungry in order to fulfil their social obligations. In the United Kingdom, the government uh, adopted a target in uh, 20, 2000 to eradicate child poverty by 2020, and that policy target was written into legislation in 2010, along with exactly what that meant using a range of indicators of poverty all the indicators had to meet the target for it to have been successful. Two of those indicators were multidimensional. They were combined low income and deprivation and severe low income and deprivation. The current government repealed, or tried to repeal the law in 2016, but they only succeeded in doing that for England and they were required by their own members of the legislature to keep publishing these indicators. In Scotland and Wales, UK is four countries, the, the legislation still stands. There were a large range of deprivation indicators which had previously been used in academic studies, uh, some of which I was involved in. Uh, they measured not just specific child deprivation items, which are age specific, so there's items for toddlers, there's items for school aged children but also deprivation amongst adults and household level deprivation. This was the latest revision in 2012. And they combine uh, a score on this deprivation index with the low income to get a multi-dimensional poverty measure. So, it's important to understand that poverty is a concept, i.e. an idea. In statistics, the term for a concept is a latent variable, i.e. a concept or construct which you cannot measure directly, but can be measured or estimated indirectly using indicators, data you can actually collect. So you can measure someone's height with a ruler, but you can't measure how poor they are or what their mathematical ability is. You need some kind of test or indicators to do that. And therefore, in order to test how well your multi-dimensional poverty works, if it's actually measuring what it's meant to measure, at the level of systematic error, or if it's reliable, whether you'll get the same results if you do another survey, how much random error there is, it's very useful to take a latent variable approach. This kind of model is a reflective measurement model, 
where the indicators are considered to be causally related to the latent rarely lost migration or poverty. So when poverty changes, if it gets better or worse, so the deprivation indicators will change. Poverty gets worse, there'll be more people going hungry, more people unable to buy clothing, more people unable to buy their children presents on their birthday. Poverty gets better, then that will, check, that will go down. This kind of approach is very useful for properties. For example, the deprivation indicators are substitutable. You can drop one or you can replace it with another. And it's not necessary to include all possible measures of deprivation, or all possible measures of income, in order to get a reliable and valid assessment of multidimensional poverty. One of the great triumphs of statistics in the 20th century was the realization that you don't have to ask all possible questions in order to get a good test. Otherwise, you would have been sitting there at your school exams for a very long time. It also means that you can use the most appropriate set of indicators for the society and culture in which you live. And then you can compare, as long as there's some, of it, some of them are in common, between countries or between areas of the countries, or between social groups. So it's a very powerful way of measuring multidimensional poverty. It's also, using this kind of statistical methods is a very powerful way of testing how good a multidimensional poverty measure is, whether it's measuring poverty, whether there's a lot of error in the measure. Is that clear? Because it's a concept some of you may not know. Yeah. Okay, so you can apply different methodologies to different countries' data. As I said, in the UK, we use a consensual methodology. I'll talk about that more a bit later. You saw some of the questions and produce an intersection approach. If you apply that to Mexican data in 2012, again, this is some of Yedis' work, uh, the poverty rate was about 47%. That compares to Conival's official multidimensional poverty poverty rate of 46%. Effectively getting identical measures, even though you're using very different indicators, because you're measuring that latent variable, which is the same in both cases. So there weren't many indicators in common. Other measures like the European Union 2020 poverty measure, very unreliable in Mexico. Joblessness is not a useful indicator. You get a very low poverty rate, Video Bolt uh, weighted measure gives a very high poverty rate of 82 percent. But again, it has so many different steps that there's some of, well, quite a lot of cumulative unreliability gets in. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that happened over the 21st century, which led to multidimensional poverty being included in the SDGs and being adopted as a target by all the governments in the world. Because in 2000, the governments of the world had adopted the Millennium Development Goals and there was no multidimensional poverty. The person who designed those goals, Jan van der Mutele, had wanted there to be measures of child poverty, measures of multidimensional poverty, but there just had not been enough research for anyone to know how to do that. So he commissioned myself and Peter Townsend and some colleagues in order to try and produce a multidimensional measure of child poverty for the poor countries in the world where there had been little research. And in order to use that as a basis for a global, first ever global study of multidimensional child poverty, and to advocate for better provision for children, but also for more global measurement of multidimensional poverty, and particularly child poverty. So, uh, the work was successful, and there were national reports in many countries, including <coughs> Mexico, and it allowed UNICEF to get in the rooms with finance ministers when they were discussing anti-poverty policy, and to get more resources to try and alleviate child uh, They did a number of studies around the world. This was by 2011. Many more followed 
uh, on that. The idea of how multidimensional poet child poverty should be measured was to take a human rights approach, similar to the measure of the approach adopted by Conival in designing the uh, official poverty measure. Obviously, they didn't use constitutional rights as in Mexico, they used uh, the International Covenant on uh, Economic, Social and Political Rights and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And the UN had argued that there was a minimum core obligation on member states of the, European, of the United Nations. That, for example, in any country where there are a significant number of individuals who are deprived of foodstuffs, essential primary health care, basic shelter, housing, education, then they are violating the human rights of their population. And the UN didn't take unaffordability as an excuse. They believed that all countries could afford this. And in 2006, the UN adopted its first ever definition of child poverty, which again takes this multidimensional approach and basically reflects on these previous minimum core obligations. So this is an idea of trying to measure the most extreme forms of child poverty in the world. So to operationalize that, the child is the unit of analyses, and you look at deprivations of health, food, education, sanitation, shelter, uh, low income in the household, safe drinking water, and a lack of income. The definition of poverty at the time was severe deprivation of basic human needs. So we set threshold criteria uh, for the components of uh, the minimum core obligation. And we produced the first ever uh, measures of child poverty across the developing world uh, based on micro data, tens of millions of cases. UNICEF and CEPAL, ACLAC, uh, produced many guides that are still available online about how to operationalize these measures. Uh, this is a, just a web page uh, produced by ACLAC. It's available in English, French, and Spanish. So the methodology was widely used. And UNICEF argued that it transformed the way that UNICEF and its partners understood and measured the poverty suffered by children. And it exposed policy makers all over the world to a new understanding of child poverty and inequalities. And as a consequence, children are more visible in the poverty reduction policies and debates, which was the purpose of these measures. It wasn't an academic study, it wasn't to produce national statistics, it was to advocate for this. So researchers at the UNICEF Office of Research in Occenti in Florence and at the University of Oxford, OFI, drew upon this deprivation approach using the available data from demographic and health surveys, multiple indicator cluster surveys, and similar survey data to produce their own kinds of versions of multidimensional poverty measures. So the UNICEF one was called Multiple Overlapping Deprivation Analyses, MODA, and uh, OFI's one is, uh, UNICEF Oxford's one is called Multidimensional Poverty Index, and UNDP uses a version of that. There is a problem in that the indicators we used were designed for measuring the most extreme poverty in the poorest countries. They were specifically designed to be zero in the richer countries and almost zero in middle income countries. And if you're trying to use these indicators to measure poverty around the world, and you're meant, these multidimensional poverty measures are meant to be for not just African countries, but middle income countries and rich countries, you're not going to get anything remotely accurate for uh, most of the countries in the world, actually. So, I'll show you some of the problems. Uh, the Multidimensional Poverty Index in Latin America was uh, published recently, uh, a few years ago, by uh, CEPAL, and uh, Hector uh, did some analyses on how reliable these measures were. The amount of random error included. So it's self-evident that a poverty rate of 20% plus or minus 
is more useful than a poverty rate of 20% plus or minus 40%. If you have a big amount of error and you measure over time, you don't know whether any changes are due to randomness or whether they're actually measuring something real. So the classical test theory measures, Cronbach's alpha, beta, omega, which are, give you reliable indicators of uh, whether the amount of random error is too large for the measure to be useful. So the normally taken threshold measures for a useful measure for alpha, which is the first column, is it should be above 0.7. For beta, it should be above 0.5. And for omega, it should be above 0.8. And with the exception of Mexico in 2004, for two of those indicators, in all other countries at all other periods of time, the measure doesn't work. That's because, as I said, the indicators are designed for measuring poverty in Africa, not measuring poverty in Latin America. And when we try and use those indicators in Latin America, get the get. Okay, so what's a better way of doing? Well, it's a very difficult problem to measure poverty in a consistent and scientific manner with low amounts of error in Finland and Berlin. These are vastly different societies. Or on a small island state in the Pacific and in Colombia. There is an adaption of Peter Townsend's methodology called the conceptual approach, which builds on his relative deprivation theory. It was designed by two uh, academic journalists, Joanna Mack and Stuart Lansley, uh, in the 1980s in Britain, and they wanted to discover whether there's a public consensus on what is an unacceptable standard of living in Britain at that time. And by that, they wanted to know if there was anyone who fell below that standard of what was the necessities of life. Uh, and uh, they wanted to incorporate the views of the public into the measurement of poverty in order to get socially realistic and culturally realistic poverty measures. So they used a democratic threshold. If more than half of the population believed something was necessary, that everyone should be able to afford and no one should do without, they then use that subset of indicators uh, as part of their poverty measure. So there are many ways this has been operationalized in many countries. This is a method in Australia where you ask the population, is a particular item or activity essential, yes or no? Then you ask them, do they have it, yes or no? And if they don't have it, you ask them if it's because they don't want it or because they can't afford it. This way you separate out choice from constraint. There are criticisms of Townsend's deprivation measures, but maybe there are some rich people who wanted to live like the poor. They didn't want to give their children three meals a day, or they didn't want to have a refrigerator. So this gets around that problem of separating choice from constraint. There are three stages in this methodology. First of all, you define what are the necessities of life in whatever country you're in, in whatever society you're in, by the majority vote of the population, using a representative survey example. Then you determine who doesn't have those necessities because they can't afford it rather than because they do not want it, so it's not a choice if they haven't got the resources. And then you determine the household income level at which people run the greatest risk of being unable to afford these necessities. And that's your multi-dimensional poverty measure that's socially realistic and has the support of the majority of the population. There is a rigorous statistical protocol uh, which helps you select the optimum subset of indicators which have the support of the majority of the population. So you need to make sure the indicators are suitable to that society. You need to make sure that they're valid measures of uh, poverty, that they're measuring poverty rather than something else. You need to make sure that they're reliable, they have a low amount of random error, and also that your index adds up. That a score of three means you're poorer than if you have a score of two. 
In the European Union, uh, these methodologies have been reviewed by the European statistical offices and the 40 statistical offices in the 28 member countries. Some countries have several statistical offices because they have regional offices. It has been passed into European law and after many years of discussing the methodology, uh, they have endorsed it as the best methodology uh, and given it unanimous support. It was also discussed at the UN expert group uh, on poverty statistics uh, uh, pre uh, five years before. These essential met methodologies can be used to supplement the standard UN methodologies, unmet basic needs methodologies that are used across Latin America for the past 50 years. So this is some work uh, Hector has been doing with Luis Picaria in uh, Argentina, in Buenos Aires, uh, where you combine the consensual deprivation ideas with the original uh, UBN indicators, and that way you uh, add reliability to the UBN indicators and still measure multidimensional quality. And this kind of methodology in Latin America will give you a much more valid, much more reliable index, and one which has majority support of the people in the country uh, compared with uh, the current so methodologies. So, you can do these statistical things, but one of the powers of this kind of methodology is the indicators are meaningful everywhere in the world because they're related to universal needs. So here we're comparing Uganda, which is a very country of 45 million people, one of the poorest in the world. Tonga, which is a small island of 100,000 people in the Pacific, which has never been colonized, one of only four societies never to have been colonized very different culture to most parts of the world, and the UK, which is a country of 65 million and one of the richest countries in the world. Very different countries. I suspect there's no one here with personal knowledge all through. And yet, you don't need to be an expert on these countries to understand the differences in levels of living of children. So, in Uganda, almost half of the children, their parents cannot afford to buy them three meals a day. In Tonga, that's 8%. In the UK, that's 1%. That's a scandal in the UK. It should be zero. Similarly, 70% of children in Uganda don't have properly fitted shoes. That's 12% in Tonga, 4% in the UK. These indicators mean things to everyone in the world. You can, of course, do the statistics and you can align, create scales in Uganda, Tonga and the UK using these latent variable methods and you can, in theory at least, then align those scales using atom response theory and other scale equating methods to show how much poorer, how much deeper the poverty in people in Uganda is compared to the UK or to Mexico. So you can then have a universal measure of deprivation which is correlated. Now this may sound like some kind of magic, but you have to remember that you have all taken many exams, history, geography, mathematics. The questions you were asked in those exams were not the same as the previous year, were not the same for the next year. And yet, the education authorities need to make sure the pass mark was not easier or harder than the previous year or the future years. And the way they do that is exactly using these kinds of methods, scale methods. So they're tried and tested methods that have been used for decades. And you can use these latent variable methods to measure poverty in low, middle, and high income countries in a multidimensionally way, and also in a way which is socially realistic and has the support of the population. So, I'm gonna to come to methodological conclusions. I believe the best method currently available to measure multidimensional poverty is to use a consensual poverty approach. It's based on a clear scientific theory and definition of poverty, unlike several other methods. 30 years of history uh, and continuous methodological development, 
It's a proven track record. It's been used in over 50 countries, from the poorest to the richest, from Benin to Sweden, or Luxembourg. The method is applicable in all countries and societies and is the only method that can reduce meaningful and comparable results in low, middle, and high income countries. One of the advantages of Peter Townsend's theory of relative deprivation is it's described as scientific because, at least in theory, it's applicable to all societies at all points in history. And there are not many definitions of poverty which have that feature. It's easy to implement using different kinds of survey methods, telephone, face-to-face -face on paper, uh, or with computer-assisted. It has high response rates, and um, the feedback we get from interviewers is people like to answer these questions. They believe they're important. The results have been shown to be valid, reliable, and repeatable. The results aren't easy to obscure and distort. People understand them. It's hard to actually fix the results. That's probably not a problem in Mexico, but it is a problem in some European countries. So that's an important property that uh, the Euro European Union likes to have in a measure. <coughs> uh, it's socially realistic method. It's easily understood and supported by both the public and policy makers. You can understand the way people are living just by looking at the raw percentages. You don't need a PhD in statistics to understand uh, what, what it means. It's also policy relevant because you can see where the problems lie. So uh, I think this is probably the best way that we can go forward with uh, measures of multidimensional poverty which are nationally owned and nationally appropriate, but also that are comparable so you can compare, say, poverty in Mexico and Guatemala directly if you wish to. And uh, for an organization like FLASCO, maybe a comparison amongst so Latin America, which is directly comparable, is an important thing to have. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, David. Pasamos ahora la sesión de preguntas. Vamos a tomar de tres. Pueden ser hechas en inglés o en español. Tenemos un excelente traductor, el doctor Nájera. Eh, el doctor Nájera eh, gentilmente se ofreció. Adelante. No te or between region zones, uh, but I'm not sure. I would like to, to have your opinion about this. And also, uh, I, I was uh, thinking uh, in the first measure that you presented, uh, you include uh, uh, somebody did uh, uh, have a, an indicator of social performance. And it uh, was, uh, uh, do you feel happy uh, just eating, uh, no, drinking tea with somebody? And I was thinking <laughs> this was an indicator of social uh, uh, characteristic. And uh, so I was thinking, uh, but uh, what about if, if somebody want to be just alone drinking tea? And how do you uh, uh, measure this difference between be alone or be with somebody, and it has to be with social, uh, uh, yeah, social characteristics in, in a country, for example. 
And and uh, my third my third question is um, why why children why not elderly uh, for poverty deprivation I know it's not uh, uh, poverty measure uh, uh, people uh, it is not a special topic it's just an institutional topic but uh, I, uh, my question is uh, you know why. UMD, for example, uh, decide to to choose first children instead of elderly people. For example, in Mexico, it will be uh, elderly uh, elder uh, people first instead of I I know I, I don't know I, I'm just imagining instead of children I don't know uh, but why why children instead of elderly uh, people? Thank you so much. Shall I answer them if you want? Okay, so. okay they're a really good set of questions. <laughs> okay, so wait. It's intuitively obvious, it's common sense, that uh, some deprivations are worse than others. It's obviously worse not to be able to afford to feed your children than to not be able to afford to buy them a bicycle. So, Common sense would tell you that you should weight up the worst things more highly. <laughs> Unfortunately, common sense and statistics don't always match. <laughs> so, when you look at these kind of statistics like Cronbach Alpha, what that interpretation of that statistic is, is it is the correlation, well, the square of that the figure is the correlation between your set of 10 indicators and the theoretical infinite set of indicators that you could ask to measure deprivation or knowledge of history or whatever it is you're testing. If you have a highly reliable measure, you will have something like 90% correlation between your measure and the infinite subset of measures. Therefore, there's very little variance left to explain. Weights will add additional information but there's very little, inf very little information that's unexplained already. Um, so all you could, if you have a reliable measure, uh, then you know, maybe you could explain an extra 10% with the weights. But the weights would have to be error free to do that. And weights are never error free. So often when you add weights, unless you have a very rigorous method for doing that, which minimizes the error of those weights, what you actually add is more error to your measure. Yeah. So the thing, weights can, are only useful when you have a very poor measure and you can try and fix it with the weights. But most of the experts in this field argue, why waste time doing that? Why not just make a better measure in the first place? Yeah. So you should concentrate your effort on making a reliable measure, not on trying to add arbitrary weights. And what you see with OFI and with the World Bank, and uh, they add weights to these measures which are effectively arbitrary. And they take what is a reasonable set of indicators and you end up with a worse measure once you apply the weights. Often when you test it, it's better before the weights are added than after because there's errors in the weights. So, uh, so what happens if you have a reliable measure is the test or index becomes self-weighting. So, if you did a multiple choice test, for example, there would be some questions which are easy, some questions of medium difficulty, and some questions which were hard. But they all had the same weighting, because if you're a good student, you get more of them right, and therefore you, you would get the hard questions right, as well as the medium ones and the easy ones right. If you're a poor student, you just get the easy ones right. So you become self-weighted and get a higher score. So that, that's the theory, and that, that's, that, that's what we use in practice. Okay, social norms. Of course, people have very different thing, ideas of what they think they should be doing. Uh, we use the, uh, the majority of what the population think. But when we ask people if they do this activity, like drinking tea with friends, we ask if they don't do it, is that because they don't want to do it? In which case they're not considered deprived. We only consider them deprived if they don't do it but would want to do it but can't afford to do it. 
we don't even see them deprived if they don't do it for other reasons, like they're scared to go out or they have no friends. <laughs> so we are looking very narrowly at constraint of stopping normal social activities. And of course, people are free not to do any of these things if they don't want to. Lastly, why children, not the elderly? Well, we were working for UNICEF, <laughs> which is the United Nations Children's Organization. But of course, when we do work for, say, the European Union, then they're much more interested in the elderly because they're a lot more elderly in the European Union than in the countries UNICEF are interested in. And the measures have to be proven to be reliable, not just for children, not just for working age, but also crucially for the elderly because in some countries the elderly are much poorer than children are and in some other places vice versa. I hope that answers your questions. Thank you. Yeah. The funeral? Yeah. The funeral? Yeah. 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 Thank you, David, for the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, two methodological questions uh, regarding this, this issue that came up. <laughs> to my mind, and uh, basically we have students here, the first question, the, the first question is, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more of the statistic behind the elaboration of the scale, what instruments or what uh, methods, you mentioned a little bit about latent variables, and the measurement model, something like that, we saw that, uh, so what is the basic background that is needed for the students to better understand the assessment of the poverty index that is proposed is the first question. It's for the students, actually. And the second question is, uh, if I am interested in the future working for small area estimation, because basically, you know, currently the, the, the poverty, as Conevan is measuring, it, it needs two sources. Basically, one is the survey, which is uh, uh, some municipalities are um, picked in the sample for measuring poverty. Some others aren't. And we need, we need to further measure the other municipalities that were picked in the sample we need an extra information like census, we use census. In this regard, if we eventually, let's suppose, we move to this uh, new approach of catching and measuring poverty, what characteristics has to have the census population in order to recover the uh, propensity of, of, to measure the poverty at the small area? basically at the municipal level. Because there should be a connection, right, between the census and the survey. Is there any uh, possibility to change the census? Or we have we can use the actual census the way it is and then use the the survey to accommodate for this small area estimation. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so there are two. Uh, ah, sorry. Take this one. Yes, I'm going to speak in Spanish. Yes, I'm an ex-student here at the Paxo. It's respect to the same factor of the ponderations of the measure. Entiendo que uno de los principales objetivos de una medición de pobreza multidimensional es permitir a los gobiernos tomar decisiones que sean útiles para mejorar el, el bienestar de las personas. Entonces, en ese sentido, una de las principales objeciones de la metodología del índice de pobreza multidimensional es que con el uso de de los métodos, de, por ejemplo, de las variables latentes, existe cierto nivel de arbitrariedad en los pesos porque son, como usted mencionó, 
autoponderados y puede ser que varíen de año en año. Entonces, para la toma de decisiones públicas de los gobiernos, puede ser que los, las ponderaciones de cada uno de los indicadores, es decir, de la importancia que tienen al interior de cada variable latente, vaya cambiando de año en año. Entonces, eso puede complicar un poco la ponderación o la prioridad que el gobierno le da a la satisfacción de ciertas necesidades de las personas para mejorar su bienestar. Eso es lo que yo entiendo que es una de las principales objeciones del equipo de OFI con respecto a ese tipo de metodologías que están basadas en métodos estadísticos. <laughs> otherwise I'm going to be speaking for a very long time so. uh, okay the statistics behind uh, the declaration measure well firstly you have to have majority support yeah? they're suitable or there are other ways of measuring suitability whether the majority have it or would want to have the item the validity we uh, do by using the uh, multi-method, multi-trait uh, methodologies, we look at the correlation between the index and other characteristics we know the poor have from generations of research. So we expect the poor to uh, be in a lower social class or lower social status. We expect that if you're suffering from deprivation, that you will consider yourself to be poor, you'll be subjectively poor. We know that poverty is a causal factor for ill health, so you would expect someone who is deprived of have a high school in the deprivation index to be more likely to have ill health after adjusting for age and gender than someone who isn't deprived. And you could also look at those kinds of measures to a, a dose-response relationship. The more depth of deprivation you have, the more likely you are to be sick. So we, we use a whole range, I think we use, for the European Union, we use five different validators. Uh, we did it for different social groups. We split the population up in different ways. For all 28 countries, we ran 32,000 regression analyses. Because we had to show it worked for all groups in all countries in order to be passed by the 40 legislatures, because if it didn't work there, then why would they bother to agree to it? So that's how we do the validity. The reliability, we use a range of methods. So we use classical test theory, the convex alpha, uh, the beta, uh, which are the, the classic ways of doing reliability analyses, and that tells you how reliable your deprivation scale is. You can also use item response theory models, uh, which make more assumptions than classical test theory. But that then tells you the properties of each individual deprivation item. It tells you if someone suffers from that deprivation, how deeply they are in poverty compared to the average person in their society in units of standard deviation. It's called severity. In English, it doesn't really translate very well into Spanish. I think of it as depth of poverty. And you can use those RT models to work out that, say, in the UK, the poor are approximately I don't know, between one and three standard deviations uh, in living standards below the average person. If you align the scales with, say, Uganda, compared to the average UK person, there would be five or six standard deviations below. 
So that is how you can compare different countries with deprivation standards. But that's, you can only do that with a latent variable approach. You can also, from the RT models, not just get an idea of the depth of poverty on each indicator, you can get an idea of how well they discriminate. So for each deprivation item, you can get a details of how well it uh, how well it discriminates between the poor and not poor. So some measures may be valid. They may be reasonably may measure depth of poverty that is reasonable, not beyond three star sigma. So you don't get so it's unreliable because you're using the survey, but it may not discriminate very well. So. An example in the Conival methodology would be the social security measure. Maybe a perfectly valid measure of poverty, but it's not very discriminatory in separating poor from not poor compared to, say, the food, the food security index, which is very good at separating, discriminating between the poor and not poor. And lastly, um, we use analysis of variance to uh, sec uh, second order interactions between all sets of variables to show that when you have a score of two on any particular combination of the deprivation items, you have a lower income on average than if you have a score of one or zero. So again, we ran we ran ten, many thousands of analyses uh, for each country in the European Union to ensure that the, uh, the, the scale was additive. Uh, there is a very thick, uh, uh, the, Book which I showed briefly on the slide, uh, manual from the Euro European Sist Polish European System Office, which goes through the methodology step by step. So we use a combination of regression, analysis of variance, classical test theory, might and response theory. Then the final step, when you're doing work in multiple countries, is you need to show that you have measurement invariance, that you are measuring the same thing in Germany and in Bulgaria. And again, you can only do this with a latent, latent variable. So what you need to show is that if you score three on the deprivation index in Finland, and you score three on the deprivation index in Portugal, you are measuring the same level of deprivation. If you're not, you can try and align the scale, but it would be the European Union did not want different questions asked in different countries for obvious reasons, because they have to sell it sort of political, although statistically there's not a problem. So you use multi-group factor analysis. That was very tricky in the past because it uses a huge amount of computer time. It was designed for testing whether girls and boys taking exams in say exactly the same age under the same conditions. Uh, the, the questions were equally hard or easy for them. There have been, of course, advances in com power computers and advances in the methodology. So using M plus and um, what's called the alignment method, you can now get a good approximation of what's called scalar invariance, where you know that the scores in each country are identical. I mean, I mean identical things. We didn't get full scalar invariance for across all 28 member states of the European Union. We got partial scalar invariance. And the trouble with these techniques is that it doesn't tell you why. Now, the survey of the European Union covers half a million households, and each country uses different methods to collect the data. Some use telephone interviews, some use partly administrative records, some use face-to-face, -face, some use computer-assisted interview. When we grouped the countries together that used the same mode of data collection, we found the measurement invariance was, was okay. It was a problem of the mode of collection, which the European Union didn't want us to go into more detail. So if you don't use the same methods to collect the data, you will get some differences. But small differences, the big difference is when we investigated them where countries had asked a different question. So one of the questions was, can you afford to replace broken or worn out furniture uh, if you need to? And in Italy, this was, not, this was not measuring the same thing. And when we looked at the Italian questionnaire, one of our colleagues is an Italian speaker, the Italian statistical office, instead of asking, 
can you afford to do this, had said, have you done this in the past year? So this is a different question, you've got a different result. So does that cover? Well, that's a quick summary. <laughs> it will take, take a bit longer to go through the details step by step. I didn't want, we would have been here for much longer if I'd gone through all the steps. But I, I, if any student's interested, there's copious documentation and I, I can provide you with, and it's all free, and I can also provide you with that. Okay, small area estimation. Uh, what we have found is crucially important for small area estimation using empirical Bayesian methods uh, is to reduce the amounts of systematic and random error in your poverty measure. If you have a good poverty measure with a low amount of error, then your small area estimation models will be good. If you have a poverty measure which contains a lot of error, then you doesn't matter how much effort you put into it, yeah. you get garbage in, garbage out, to use the American expression. So it's very important to follow these kinds of rigorous methods and throw, I mean, it's very, very, uh, very disturbing doing this methodology because you start with a large set of indicators and you do the test reliability, the test validity, the test additivity, and you end up throwing most of them away. Mm -hmm. And so at the beginning, we uh, always asked each other, what do you think will be in the final index? And we, I have never got it right, never once. None of my colleagues did. <laughs> you did the same, didn't you, in Argentina? The, the head of the statistical office was the furthest away. <laughs> <laughs> so it is not a matter of opinion. Anyone doing the same set of analyses on the same data will effectively get the same result. Uh, the Bayesian estimators, the you know, IEBLUB models, obviously you take from your poverty, latent poverty measure, multidimensional poverty measure, people with different characteristics in your society are more or less likely to be poor. And you can use both the survey data and census data in combination in order to estimate uh, at small areas what the likelihood is a, a percent of the poor point estimate. Or you can fit a trend surface uh, to the census data using the geographically weighted regression. Do you want to add something about the yeah, 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 sorry. does more of this than me. Si entendí bien la la pregunta de Delfín, o la última parte de la pregunta de Delfín fue si se necesita el mismo set de variables o qué tan grande tiene que ser el set de variables de la encuesta respecto al censo eh, tiene que haber variables en común, algunas y lo importante es que las variables en común sean predictores fuertes de pobreza eh, por ejemplo en otros países lo que tenemos es el método consensual en una encuesta los predictores clásicos de pobreza ocupación, eh, género edad composición del hogar, tamaño del hogar, etcétera, que eso generalmente está en un censo en los países en desarrollo y eso es suficientemente bueno por un buen modelo estadístico para producir estimaciones en áreas pequeñas. En México lo que yo creo es, si se levantara el método consensual, eh, habría que incluir algunas variables sociodemográficas básicas, ocupación, quizá algunos indicadores de privación, pero no, no siento que tenga que ser una batería muy grande, para eh, utilizar el censo tal cual como está, sin modificar el censo, para hacer buena predicción basado, digamos, en el método consensual. Eh, es decir, no creo que tengamos que hacer muchos cambios eh, al censo, quizá ninguno, de hecho. Yeah, ok, uh, wait. As you correctly point out, MOFI have a fixed set of weights which apply to all dimensions equally and within dimensions equally to all variables and apply to all countries at all points in time. This adds error to your measure because it doesn't reflect reality. The reason the weights change when you're using a latent variable method is because that's a reflection of the true value in reality. If you have a model with fixed weights, 
then the data will not fit your model if you run a confirmatory factor analysis. And therefore, your reliability on each of your dimensions, education, health, standard of living, will be so high that you do not know what the results mean. If you have, if your typical OFI measure, the uh, error would be 20%. Yep. So if you are saying uh, there is a score of 10 on the health indicator, plus or minus 20%, I do not believe that is useful for policy purposes. Yeah, but that, that was not my question. My question was, what is the relevance of a measure in which the weights of the indicators vary between year and year? Because a government want to have a measure that is relevant in each year and in, in the weights of each, of each indicator uh, have the same order across the, across the time. Yeah. So you're, you're trying to measure multiple, well, to us, you're trying to measure multidimensional poverty as society changes, the error associated with each, with each item will also change, and so the weights will change because you're trying to measure the latent variable. The weights may change on each individual item, but the measure of multidimensional poverty will be correct. If you don't change the weights, then the measure of multidimensional poverty will not be correct. So if you're trying to see if your anti-poverty policy is working, you want to know whether poverty is going up or down. If you don't allow the weights to vary, you will not know if poverty is going up or down. You can use the individual deprivation items as just statistics like I showed, and that gives you other policy relevant information, say for the education indicators, or the food indicators, or the clothing indicators. But you don't need to change the world. Not inside the measure. Well, but you don't, they're, they're two separate things. Yeah? You can use the deprivation indicators as standalone, but if you want to combine income with deprivation, to make a multidimensional poverty measure where you know that the people who are suffering from poverty have little money and also uh, the, um, the outcomes of that little money is they are not being able to participate in society and have the things that uh, people think they should have, then you need to use a latent variable approach. Because poverty is an idea, you cannot measure it directly with a ruler. Yeah? The only way you can measure a concept like poverty is with a latent variable approach. If you don't use a latent variable approach, you will not be measuring it with a, with a, a low amount of error, and you will end up with perverse policy conclusions. And poverty, you know, is an important phenomenon. It really exists. It, people die young because of poverty, so it's important to measure it accurately. Comparative with other countries, but what happened in that because uh, the cost of the things that caused the deprivation changed in time. So it's my first doubt. Uh, second, uh, which is the cost of this program implementation? Uh, how uh, I, I understood that UNICEF paid you for this uh, kind of program. Well, for this kind of index, yeah. how uh, how much cost? If Mexico, if I suppose that Mexico wanted, how yeah. how it cost? <laughs> 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 I suppose. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> I don't say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and second, uh, is there any uh, if this uh, program it's uh, it fits with a survey or a sample? Uh, how how do you regulate the data? You question the people, how, how many is 
the people that you question this this time. Um, how is to compare? Uh, how is to comparable? The have a have a country that have less than one million people with UK that have 60, 68 million people. I I have this out in my mind. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, the third question is. You have any suggestion of public policy about this? Because uh, now you have measure, but what is next of this? Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, I would like to thank you for this for this wonderful conversation. Uh, it's great that you can share your experience and your knowledge in this topic with us. And we have had some previous talks about uh, the, methodolo the methodology used by Bristol. And um, probably this question has been answered in that talks, but I would like to hear your particular answer. And my question is, what's the difference between inequality and poverty in the context of relative deprivation? Because I think they are correlated in this context. Thank you. Thank you, it's a, a very short one. I would like to know if the survey included immigrants, and if it didn't, like how can one estimate poverty of immigrants in the European Union? Okay, <laughs> there are a lot of things. <laughs> okay, what happens over time? Uh, so, in the UK, the surveys have been done independently by academics every decade since the 60s. It had one in 68, 69, uh, 83, 99, 2000, etc. Uh, 2012. And as society has changed over 50 years, so certain consumer durables have become more important and others have become less important and certain behaviours have become more important less important. So, for example, in the 1960s, uh, no one thought a computer was a necessity that people would have. In the latest survey, a majority of parents of school-aged children believe a computer is necessary if they're at secondary school because so much emphasis is now placed on going and Googling things or getting things off the school website for your home. So, we would never even have included a computer in the past, now we do. Uh, things like um, having a special meal on Sunday with your family. I'm afraid in the UK, uh, people now use their microwaves and pierce and ping, and they don't eat together so much. So the importance of that's gone down. The importance of wearing a dressing gown or the way you dress has changed over 50 years. So it doesn't matter if you're using a latent variable approach because as things become less important, they eventually drop out of your index. <coughs> and as new things come in, uh, they, uh, they become, they, the key might get added. What we tend to find is it's much slower for things to drop out, for people to say they're no longer necessary than it is for new technology to come in. Uh, so we can compare over 50 years, not using just using academic data, but also government data, we, uh, both the changes in society and what the population believes important and not, but also how poverty has changed using a consistent methodology, uh, which gives you a consistent result. So we know that poverty has gone up and down, uh, and we know uh, how society is also changing in what they what, what the other, the majority of the population believe are the necessities of life. So it's a very powerful method from that point of view. And what we find is that uh, in times of severe austerity, when the incomes of the population are depressed, 
So what they considered were the necessities of life become less generous. When uh, there's a boom time and people have lots, the majority have lots of money, so they're more generous in what they think of the necessities of life. And that reflects the relative nature of poverty. How many people uh, did we interview? Uh, the, EU, the EU silk interviews half a million households, uh, it's over a million people. Um, the information we had for the UNICEF work was data from 50 odd countries, including China. The China sample alone was two and a half million. So for most of, we, do, we tended to do five year rounds and in each round we had uh, about a 1% sample of the global population. How comparable they are small island states with uh, something like the UK? Well, that depends on how good your sample is. But when you get down to very small countries with uh, 300 households, then the statistics begin to break down. The way you have 100,000 people, you can because you can do a big enough sample fashion. You're basically doing a mini census, or a partial census in those countries. But that's a common problem of small island states. So we're writing a poverty report in Tuvalu, which I think after the Vatican is the smallest country in the world. It's got 10,000 people. But we interview about half the population. <laughs> so that has quite a high reliability because of a very large sample collection. Public policy suggestions, I have many. <laughs> but we would be here for a very long time. Maybe we should have that conversation. It depends on, on where, you, where, where you read. Obviously, uh, in rich countries, there really is no excuse for poverty. What we find is poverty is very expensive uh, because it means people have worse health outcomes, they're more likely to be sick, they tend to do worse at school, they don't get a high education attainment for their children, uh, and therefore they tend not to get as good jobs as people who aren't poor. And you can do econometric models which show that if you were to raise the standard of living of poor children in the UK to just above the poverty line, uh, you would save more money than it costs. So the cost of child poverty in the UK is about 39 billion dollars. Pounds, that's about 50 billion US dollars. The cost of eradicating is similar. And you'd have a much better society. So it's economically neutral. Of course, the problem is you need to invest today and you get the, um, you get the return when the children grow up and become adults in 18 years' time. And that's why politicians don't do it. But in rich countries, there really is, it makes sense to invest in your, your children and invest in the elderly. In poor countries, there are other policy problems. Okay, inequality and poverty. Um, in a relative deprivation, it's about being excluded from the norms of your society. Inequality, you can have high inequality societies where you don't have many poor people. Norway would be an example, many of the Nordic states. They have quite high levels of inequality, but they have very low levels of poverty because they have a welfare state which redistributes quite a lot of money from men to women, and it redistributes money across the life course, so uh, money is taken away from you with heavy taxation when you're earning the most, and you get that money back in terms of family benefit in childhood and pensions in old age. So instead of your income going up and down across the life course, it's much flatter. And there's not so much redistribution from rich to poor in the big countries, which most people don't understand. And that way you get eradication of poverty or very low levels. So the UK targets to eradicate poverty were to get down to Norwegian and Danish levels. They considered that eradication. Uh, so if you look, I haven't got the slide, if you look at the amount of redistribution in Mexico, before and after tax, there's very little difference. If you look at it in Sweden or Denmark, it's a massive difference. And so lots of money is given to families with children, to the elderly, uh, 
by this through distribution and they have bit of cover to in terms of people not being able to participate in their societies. And that tends to mean they get much better results. So if you look at the PISA scores for the top ranked it is Finland. It's not because they teach differently, it's that they don't have the de child deprivation. Lastly, immigrants. Uh, <laughs> and yet the immigrants are included in the surveys for most of the countries. I wouldn't be so sure about Hungary, but they're meant to. <laughs> <laughs> so in the UK, I'm sure the immigrants are included. Uh, it's not based on whether you're a citizen of the country. It's just based if you're going to be there for more than six months. So if you're a Mex student from Mexico and you were studying for two years, they would knock on your door and interview you. Uh, again, I'm not so certain about some of the countries in Europe at the moment, but that's the protocol. That should be included. When we do work in places like Hong Kong, there is some of the servants are not included. Bien, si, si no hay más eh, preguntas a mí, me gustaría hacer un comentario de un minuto, eh, porque se trata de, de una idea que creo que por modestia la gente que trabaja en la línea de Cristo no la dice. Eh, todos sabemos que en torno a la medición de pobreza hay discusiones que en el pasado fueron mucho más violentas que en la actualidad, pero no hace mucho tuvimos algunas medidas que discrepaban bastante. Lo que nos está ofreciendo la Escuela de Listo es, a partir de una idea básica, que es muy propia de las ciencias sociales, pero no es solo de las ciencias sociales. Y esta idea es que los conceptos que usamos no son directamente observables. Todos, por la gran mayoría. Y la pobreza no es capaz a esta característica. Lo que, lo que traen es la teoría de la medida, la teoría de la medición. Es una teoría que se empieza a desarrollar fines del 19, comienzos del 20. Y que la han aplicado fundamentalmente los psicólogos, psicólogos sociales, por mucho tiempo traen esa teoría, traen conceptos de esa teoría como confiabilidad, como validez y como la comparabilidad en el tiempo de la medición. Tres conceptos que nos permiten a nosotros discutir aceptando de que no observamos directamente el fenómeno, nos permiten discutir acerca de cuál es la mejor medida. Será mejor aquella que sea confiable, aquella que sea válida y que permita la comparabilidad. Es decir, nos permite ir un paso más allá que la simple postura, mi medida es mejor por las razones que quieran, porque doy las ponderaciones correctas, o porque incluye el café y la tuya no, no incluye el café. <risa> fue, un, fue un artículo. Sí. De <risa> fue un artículo, ¿no? Está publicado. Eh, es decir, tenemos la posibilidad de discutir racionalmente cuál es la mejor medida y cuál sería la medida más útil. Ahora, respecto al costo, hay que tomar en cuenta que la encuesta más cara que hay 
es una encuesta con la que se calcula la pobreza al día de hoy no es una encuesta eh, diseñada para medir pobreza es una encuesta diseñada para calcular los ponderadores del índice nacional de precios al consumidor y es muy cara muy cara porque tiene que levantar información de gasto tal vez lo que necesitamos es tener una encuesta que nos permita medir pobreza y probablemente será una encuesta más, más barata bueno eh, yo quería agregar esta, estas dos ideas que creo que pueden ser importantes para redondear eh, eh, aquello que David no, claramente no, no dijo porque no, no puede estar diciendo bueno, la, la contribución de nosotros es ¿no? eh, eh, tal y no, no, no puede hacer pues, por modestia tienen que darlo a, a saber implícitamente pero como yo estoy fuera entonces sí, <risa> sí lo puedo decir eh, David, thank you very, very much. Uh, y realmente eh, muchas gracias por eh, haber asistido a esta eh, muy provechosa e interesante plática. Gracias. gracias.